Hello, my fellow human beings. Today, I am very excited to say that I had a conversation, my second on this show, with Anders Sandberg. He's the Senior Research Fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. And this is the same organization that released the letter that recently came out that was written by Max Tegmark. And uh, this is a, a letter all about artificial intelligence signed by 26,000 leaders in the space that called for a six-month halt to AI development to allow companies and governments to align and make guardrails for this new technology. So I came into Anders and I said, let's talk about this because it is a letter that he signed. And we get into what is comprehending how artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence could actually look like, what it would do to our economy, um, the probability of, of robots experiencing consciousness in the same way we do, and how would we know that that is actually happening? How can we predict the capabilities of artificial intelligence? Why is that prediction so bad sometimes? Is it a black box? Do we actually not understand how these technologies work? Um, so we go directly into all of it. You know, how, what kind of guardrails should we put up in terms of artificial intelligence? How open or controlled should it be? Should it be open sourced? And, you know, what would our economy and what should our economy look like with the existence of this technology? Anders is incredibly intelligent. He's an absolute joy to talk to. His passion is palpable and contagious. So I am excited for you to listen to this. And uh, please let us know what you think of the episode. Reach out to us on our social media at Type 1 Planet or visit us at type1planet.net. And we'd love to get these conversations going. Every comment, for the most part, is very, uh, is very helpful for us. And um, even the perspectives of people saying, this is an absolute bullshit idea. I have no idea why you would even put this on your show. That's great data, and that's something that we can actually come to our guests with, and they might want to come back on and say uh, why they're, you know, to, to put their ideas up against scrutiny. So enjoy. Without further ado, this is Anders Sandberg on Type 1 Planet. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Type 1 Planet podcast. And I'm here speaking once again with Anders Sandberg, Senior Research Fellow at the Future of Humanity. Institute of Oxford. Anders, thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I first have to ask, uh, we had a short conversation before we got started. What are you working on right now? And you mentioned one of our previous uh, guests that just an episode just came out uh, with Kareem Jabari. What's going on with Kareem? So right now I'm uh, over at the Institute for Future Studies in Stockholm. And Karim and me are starting up a, a little new institute inside that one, which might hopefully eventually grow into a big adult institute and leave the nest. And that is right now the working name is the Mimir Institute for Long-Term Futures. Really thinking about the long term, making an institute to do academic studies about existential risk, systemic risk, what are we going to do about uh, digital minds, etc. So I'm excited. Oh, great. Well, let's... I'm, let's talk a little bit about digital minds. <laughs> I think that's, uh, you know, we got to only touch on it a little bit when we first spoke. And since we've spoke uh, only a few months ago, an incredible amount of technology has been rolled out with AI image generators, natural language processors, bots that can code and paint and make music and do all the things that we thought was impossible a few years ago. So, and I, you know, also was prompt, prompt to reach out because a letter came out from from your organization that was written by Max Tegmark, uh, signed by 26,000 leaders in the space, that called for a six-month halt to AI development and to allow for companies and governments to align, make guardrails uh, for this new technology. So my question for you is, first, what was your reaction to this uh, announcement? Um, were, you, were you surprised at all? And then did you sign the letter? Uh, why or why not? Yeah, so the letter from Max Tegmark and the Future of Life Institute, I was not surprised that they made such a letter and I did sign it. I also felt, yeah, yeah, right, the stopping AI development for six months, that's not going to happen. And actually, the letter didn't claim that, oh, everybody put down your computers and sit down and think in a big circle. That's not what it's stating. It says, we should not be training the large, uh, the big models uh, for six months. We need some time to figure out how to handle the ones we already have and set the, up some form of institutional framework. Now, that certainly got everybody talking. And of course, a lot of people misunderstood uh, what was being said or uh, felt like, oh, those Luddites led by uh, the famous Luddite Elon Musk. What? Uh, that seems weird. Others are saying the letter is not going far enough. 
and so on and so on. So there's been a very vigorous debate, which I think is actually the actual the good outcome of the letter. I think uh, realistically, you shouldn't expect uh, people to coordinate that well. But I think we should need to backtrack a bit to, to the story about why do people in AI actually get worried about their own field? That is kind of a weird uh, topic. Yeah. So why, you know, it does seem strangely symbolic. I think just with basic game theory in mind, you know that the companies are not going to stop, you know, because they'll be worried that someone else won't stop and then they'll be behind. So, you know, what was the purpose of this letter? You know, what are people actually worried about? Why would they write it if they, if this is such a low probability that would actually happen? Well, the, there is something about speech acts. So when I make a promise, the, it's not the information that is being conveyed. It's that I'm stating certain things and you know I promised you to do certain things. That actually matters. Uh, similarly, making a pronouncement might send a signal that I care deeply about this. And here is a big pile of experts and uh, other people uh, like me who are really, really concerned about this. That is something that politicians, decision-making CEOs and the public might want to take into account. So there is an important aspect of making it clear that, yeah, here are a lot of people with a lot of expertise in the field and they are concerned, seriously concerned. So concerned that we're actually making a fairly outrageous idea that maybe we need to regulate the technology we develop. Because as many people normally in most industries would say, yeah, we don't want more regulations of our industry. We already have way too much. Uh, it would be much better for everybody if we had actually had less regulation. But in this case, people in a nascent, very powerful industry are actually saying, please, we actually want to have some guardrails. Now, that might not be laws and strict constraints. It might just be safety standards. It might be best practices. But the really interesting question is, why are people thinking this is important? I think there are two reasons. One is it's moving tremendously fast right now, much faster than people even inside the field can keep up with. And the second part is, it looks like it's potentially very, very powerful. And it's hard to stress how powerful artificial intelligence could be. And to people outside who think that, yeah, that's just hype, they have this weird situation that, okay, so maybe you're hyping by claiming it's powerful and hence dangerous, but why aren't other industries doing that? Why aren't the nuclear industry claiming that we got the power of the atom and it's super dangerous? No, they want to say that we're nice and cuddly and safe. Why don't biotechnology say we're going to change the nature of life and that raises tremendous risks? No, they are usually talking about how safe everything is. Why is AI different? And I think that is a very important discussion because it is something very new that is happening. Even though there is also hype, there is a lot of misunderstanding, there is a lot of people doing game theory and strategizing about what we're saying and doing. Sometimes for very selfish reasons, sometimes just because we're confused. Well, I think the what makes this technology so different is that it turns out that our ability to predict to predict the capabilities of AI systems is really bad. We, you know, uh, they keep doing things that surprise us, and that doesn't happen when you build, you know, a nuclear reactor. You know exactly what that's going to do. You know, you know exactly what your Tesla is going to do, but. We keep getting surprised by ChatGBT for, you know, it keeps doing something new and we're like, oh my God. So why is our capability to predict it so bad? Is it because we don't actually know how it works? I think that is a deep part of it. So we're talking about some of the most complex systems ever devised by humanity. Uh, in terms of internal degrees of freedom of the number of pieces going on, I think they're more complex than the most complex uh, uh, microprocessors we ever built. They have a tremendous number of details and we don't make them by hand. We use other machines to make them. We're indeed machines to make the machines to make the machines. So that means that they're not well understood. Indeed, there are deep theoretical questions that we're just starting to make some headway on. And there are also these practical surprises. Um, and that is also why the letter, I think, makes sense. Every time we get a new big foundational model like GPT-3 or GPT-4, it follows a sequence of weeks and months where people discover what it can do and get funny or horrifying surprises. Sometimes uh, these ones are simple to get over. Sometimes it uh, launches new inquiries. 
But it takes a while before we know what it can do. If we get a new foundation model too early, we might actually not have learned the lessons from the previous one. So for example, when the GPT-4 showed up, people started to notice something that got the nickname, the Valuigi effect. It, you can try to instruct it to behave in a proper way. And of course, men, most companies uh, wanting you to use the system don't want them to give uh, uh, the terrorist uh, advice, don't want them to threaten customers. Generally, they need to be bland and boring and well-behaved. And it turned out to, to be surprisingly easy to subvert this. And that was a bit strange. Why was it so easy to subvert it? And the, the reason turns out to be that much of the training data we put in into these systems is based on human fiction. And of course, in fiction, it's very common to have characters pretending to hold, uh, hold some views when actually being a different one. That treachery is part of good storytelling. It makes for an exciting narrative. And we have trained a lot of these language models on these narratives. So if you can just entice them to use that little treacherous turn, suddenly you get them to misbehave in all sorts of interesting ways. And it's a very weird form of misbehavior because normally in programming you expect syntax errors or technical errors. But in this case, it's almost a literary or a plot error. We might actually need the English literature mayors to help us out here by understanding the way characters behave in the stories. That oh, is unexpected. That's fascinating. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And I think the deep issue is that we don't have that complex minds. And we're living in a complex world. And we have fed this complex world into these other complex systems that are not even like minds we normally encounter. So that means that we, we are not great at predicting them. We're pretty decent at predicting what other people do because we are people, we have seen a lot of people, and most people fall into a number of categories. Some people are mentally disturbed to a sufficient degree are very creepy because you don't know how they think and react. But that's nothing compared, to, of course, to an artificial neural network, which is utterly alien. Yet we might put on a mask, so to say, to make it behave itself so we can use it to, to answer questions, so to write boilerplate uh, and, uh, copy for our marketing campaign or coming up with a research paper. But behind that mask, there is something very, very different. And sometimes the mask falls off and you see it comes face to face to something, with something disturbing and weird. And we're not used to that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about consciousness. Uh, I'm going to bring us to, it'll be a little roundabout, um, because as we get into comprehending what AGI would actually look like, you know, from your perspective, what is consciousness? How do we define when something has consciousness? Is that uh, an, a question you'd be prepared to answer? Uh, my answer is I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> so I'm originally a computational neuroscientist, and I always felt very much at home in dealing with memory because that's something that you can you know, observe. You can do operational tests of uh, whether an animal or a human remembers something. Uh, it's easy to deal with. Consciousness is certainly something we to some extent observe, but it's much more complex. And true observation of consciousness is always private. It's always subjective. Uh, I can't tell if others are conscious or even whether they experience the same kind of qualia as I do. This quickly leads to a lot of complications if you're a simple neuroscientist. And mm. I do find philosophy of mind very tough go. I prefer many other parts of philosophy over philosophy of mind. It is a tricky and to some extent unsolved problem. We don't really know how to grasp consciousness that well. We certainly know a few things about it but we don't have a great theory for it. And this is still consciousness about humans and animals and the normal things. Now the AIs show up and they are things that are very different from the things we know can be conscious. And indeed, there are many people who say that, oh yes, it's absolutely impossible for a computer to be conscious. And they have various arguments, which uh, in some quite often take issue with, but it's not entirely obvious that we know for certain that computers can be conscious. It might be that certain forms of code cannot be conscious because uh, how we're or it's organized. You may maybe you need feedback loops, for example, to be truly conscious. That seems reasonable, except that you can sometimes unfold feedback loops in a linear way, and then a different program, which I normally would not claim could be conscious, might actually be conscious. 
that gets very, very confusing. To add the uh, kind of cherry of extra confusion on top of this, when we're dealing with the large language models, they're trained on data from humans. And we're conscious. We love talking about consciousness and our inner experience. And the language models pick up on that and will, of course, make the same kind of statements, regardless of whether they have an inner experience or not. Indeed, if you ask them, are you conscious? Well, in most uh, human texts, if somebody asks you, are you conscious? You're supposed to crossly re respond, of course I am. I, I'm a total normal human, just like you. And at this point, of course, the AI program will say, of course I'm conscious. I'm a total normal thinking being, just like you. Regardless of whether it actually is a thinking being. So we're adding this confusion on top because we trained them in a particular way. But even if you don't use a language model, if you use something like a reinforcement learning agent, it might very well be that we're glimmering of pleasure and pain in the reinforcement signals. But we don't know. Some people think that maybe we need to start caring for them. Others say, this is ridiculous. That signal is a number in a, a binary register somewhere in a computer. You, you can't get pleasure and pain out of juggling numbers. It's like we're training ourselves now to treat them like they're conscious beings. You know, to treat ChatGPT, which I'm sure people are already dating ChatGPT and talking to them every day and how was your day and all that stuff. And, you know, they're, they're treating it like it's a conscious being and we're training ourselves as a species to see it that way even before we're there. So, mm -hmm. you know, at, at some point it's like, what is the probability that, you know, at some point it switches to AGI and we just have no conception of, uh, in terms of a behavioral change on the back end. Yeah. And it's a tricky thing because treating something that is conscious as if it's not conscious, that's quite often morally a very bad thing. Uh, on the other hand, treating something that's not conscious as conscious, quite often that's fine. Uh, better safe than sorry. And sometimes it's actually cute when uh, you're very human thing to do about uh, your dolls. Yeah, they're not conscious, but they in some sense symbolize something conscious. Indeed, somebody mistreating dolls is a kind of creepy person, even though we know the dolls don't have any consciousness. Uh, it still is kind of significant that somebody is behaving badly against the doll. The problem is, of course, if we just get used to treating everything as conscious, we might lose the discernment of what really matters and what doesn't matter. And that might be tricky. If we start saving dolls in preference over children from a burning house, we, we obviously failed at something. Right. And this can get very confusing uh, when we make systems that have this tendency to fool us. Because the part of the language model that is most important is that it's predicting a plausible continuation of the text or signals it's giving out. And that is, of course, in, in some sense, always about fooling us. It just happens to be that many of these sequences of text also correspond to reality in a useful way. If I ask you to write some useful philosophical arguments, quite often it latches on to decent philosophical arguments. Maybe not the best and the most novel ones, but it's an argument. And similarly, in, a, in a con pretending to be conscious, it comes very naturally, given that we humans pretend to be conscious most of the time. Oh, and then now you're really getting into philosophy of mind, you know, with the whole walking zombie ex uh, argument. Now, I mean, but I think it would be a fallacy to to say that a form of robotic consciousness would be in any way comparable to human because, like, for example, the, just just purely the example of how we experience time and how a computer would experience time, I feel like that would al uh, hugely alter the way that it experiences consciousness as well, you know, if it's on a completely different time scale than us. Uh, and you also have the embodiment issue. There is a strand in robotics talking about embodied cognition and arguing that, yeah, pure software can't actually think. Uh, it needs to be embodied in the world to actually ground it, which sounds nice, but you could imagine the embodiment being a virtual reality with a physics simulation. Does that mean that embodiment can be pure software or does it always have to be physical? You can get weird forms of consciousness here, especially since clock speeds can change. You can uh, branch off processes, and uh, so you can run your AI and then make several copies, give them slightly different stimuli, and then keep the one that gives the right answer. What happens there? So you end up with all the weird philosophical thought experiments being totally doable for real in the computer.
And if we now start worrying that mm, maybe some of these systems are conscious and have a moral value that means that we need to care for them to some extent, ooh, which of these experiments should we not be doing? Even worse, if you get alien forms of consciousness, how do you handle that morally? We're having trouble enough uh, to figure out how to treat our own kind of consciousness nicely. Right. So let's another talk a big bit question. Of, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Another big question is, of course, whether we even should care about consciousness in the debate about uh, AGI, because maybe you can have a non-conscious form of general intelligence that is really, really good at solving problems and having goals. It's just that it's nobody there. And right. that raises a uh, creepy question. Maybe that still has some moral value. Most people assume that you need to be conscious for uh, things to matter to you, and hence uh, only conscious entities have value. But there are people also arguing that ecosystems and even the non-living natural environment might have intrinsic value without actually being conscious. So it's not entirely obvious there. And you might end up with a world where you have very powerful, very elaborate non-conscious agents that are still participating in the world. Mm. Yeah, it, it dances on the line between being a tool and being an entity, right? Um, it, and uh, just... often we get into trouble when that line gets blurred. Uh, we are worried about treating other people like tools, where we know we should not be doing that. Yet in practice, uh, uh, if I need uh, somebody uh, to help me and uh, put up a picture on the wall, I'm kind of treating my friend as a tool for holding the picture in place. But if I'm polite enough and uh, he's volunteering, etc., we're fine about that. There are other forms of use of people that are more tool-like and we get more uneasy about it. But what about the butler robot that is uh, infallibly polite and uh, serves us stuff? Shouldn't we be polite back? And we might say, yeah, maybe you can and maybe you call, uh, shouldn't. But you have telemarketers. They're in some sense a human acting as an appendage from a company uh, calling during dinner uh, to tell you about your new, new phone plan. Okay, do I have to be polite to the guy in the phone uh, because uh, he said you, well, he might be replaced soon with the language model, in which case, should I be polite to that voice? We have a lot of problems here. Joanna Bryson in a famous paper, and, 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 or the, the title of the paper was Robots Should Be Slaves. And she very clearly said that we should design them to be clear tools uh, but, because otherwise we are going to get confused and that's going to be bad for us. But we have the option of designing them to be obvious as tools. Mm. Let's not go down the road where we get confused about them. But in practice, mm. we're already confusing ourselves. So I don't think many people took their and, uh, the, the bad advice from Joanna. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about why you signed that letter. Then you know, um, what is the best way that we approach AI development, tool development? You know, or or how controlled or open should it be? Should it be open sourced? That kind of that kind of stuff. What would you recommend? So I have been having enormous fun playing around with stable diffusion models for making uh, pictures using AI. And they're open source and uh, I can play around with them freely without having to worry about censorship from any company that might uh, disagree with how I use it. I think this is great, but it's also not that dangerous. Yes, I can make naughty pictures. I can make pictures of political leaders in compromising situations, but it's not the end of the world. I think many of the other bigger systems we're building are more powerful and potentially pose bigger risks. And that suggests that we might want to learn how to re regulate them or at least make them safe before it's too late. Right now, we're still at the toy model stage. Right now, few political decisions are being made by, by, uh, by chat GPT. There are already politicians who use language models to write their speeches but probably they're not basing the decisions on the models. Not yet. Mm. But you're going to get to the point where a lazy politician uh, decides that's actually a good proposal. Let's run with it. So I think what we should be doing is actually developing better ways of measuring how safe something is, figuring out what are good industry practices and best practices, and actually starting to build the institutions for making that happen. Just like electricity, we have a lot of standards about and how you get to install electricity in your home, uh, what kinds of connectors and plugs and fuses are appropriate and which ones are unsafe. 
uh, insurance companies have uh, developed a model of what uh, the electrical faults are your fault and which ones they will cover. We need the same thing for AI. That's going to be a lot of work. It's a form of soft regulation. Uh, now, what would these, you know, for in the in the case of AI, what would these guardrails actually look like? You know, what recommendations would be made to companies saying, "Hey, let's let's try to let's try to limit this sort of development, or let's try to encourage communication between companies to to guide development in this direction." You know, how, how is it that we can have these conversations with these companies that are trying to move as quickly as possible? Uh, I think most of these companies might want to beat the competition, but they don't want to sell a product that blows up in their faces. So they want to have ways of testing safety and even compare safety to realize when they're ahead or behind competitors. So OpenAI did an interesting study for GPT-4 where they actually had an outside group testing various safety aspects and figuring out ways of misusing it so they could actually plug those holes before uh, launching the product. And I think we might want to develop both uh, safety standards. For every new model, you run it through a few tests and says, okay, how much is it going to lie and deceive? How easy is it uh, to get it to, to believe in conspiracy theories? How good is it at coming up with terrorist plots? And uh, how good is it at finding loopholes? Um, now, these things are useful. You might want to have scales. You might want to have standard methods of testing it out. You might also want to define some red lines that, okay, here is a capability that we know we don't want to have around in society. So let's uh, have a general view about that. Let's make that an industry strategy. This doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have laws enforcing it. It might just be an industry agreement. That might be easy to do. You might also want civil society to have a bit of say here because many people say, of course, that wait a minute, there is just a few companies making these models. They're going to become very, very powerful if this is going to be a foundation of our economy. We might want to have a say in how they get to be used and how you get to check that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Right. It's, it's, it's interesting to compare it to, for example, fusion energy, right? You know, in fusion, I think very few people can argue against uh, its efficacy and how good it could be for our society. And yes, those companies will make a lot of money, but they'll also create uh, an unfathomable amount of low cost energy to the entire world, right? So, you know, is there a best case scenario for creating artificial intelligence? You know, assuming it's created, it's going to fall to fundamentally alter and potentially destroy the economic value of millions of people where they lose their jobs. And that's we're already in that space. We know we're going to go there. We know that the telemarketers that you were just talking about are going to lose their jobs, that the truck drivers will lose their jobs, that, you know, and, and you know, what is the best case scenario here if, if assuming that we continue in the same trajectory that we're going now? So the best case scenario is, of course, that the telemarketers are now instead herding a lot of bots marketing people, uh, marketing to people on a vast scale. Uh, the truck drivers are instead handling the fleets of trucks. Many jobs get transmuted and transformed. Artists are not so much painting every shadow as pointing out to the AI model roughly what kind of shadows uh, they want or are playing around with styles and new possibilities. So you basically use AI to empower people and the, you get new kinds of jobs that wouldn't exist before. So it's not so much a vast unemployment as we're just running around the busier than ever before, but now supported by much more AI. In that world, you might also get a lot of safety because we also use artificial intelligence to check things before uh, they go out into reality, whether they're safe. We uh, use this to police dangerous technologies we uh, use various AIs to check for what are side effects of doing this. So you get advice and you can actually make things that are more reliable or less reliable. Yeah. In that world, we would be tremendously much richer because just like fusion power produces a lot more energy and you can use that energy to you know, fix the environment and uh, run uh, a lot of the planet better. A world where you have enormous mind power in the cloud that for any problem, you can actually turn loose the cloud on solving problems. That's going to make us much better off. 
many people are worried about control and uh, issues of equality here. I'm less concerned about equality. I don't think necessarily that's the super most important thing. Other people disagree with me about that. But it's certainly clear that you don't want to have a very small group controlling everything. And you could end up with that given the logic uh, of training very large machine learning models of very large amount of data requiring very big data centers that only a few uh, groups can afford. Then you might end up with a situation, of course, where the control of the foundations of civilization are in the hands of a few. Sometimes that's not very problematic. The power company might control uh, who gets the light, but they're regulated, they're integrated with society, and it's not too problematic. Uh, It's just that we don't want to have a total monopoly. Mm. A more subtle thing, however, is that you might have a monopoly of thought. If these models all have biases of various kinds, that might be problematic. Many people are worried about machine learning model picking up racism and sexism and other bad biases that exist in human society and distilling them. But another worrisome thing is, of course, that we might pick up just the mainstream and have that as a bias, being a very strong conformism bias versus all the weirdos and people trying to do different new things, which is normally how human civilization moves forward. It's rarely the mainstream that is at the vanguard of doing things better in a new creative way. But I think the best case scenario is that we get this enormous mind power, we can use it to solve problems, both problems that today would be too expensive to solve. I can't have 10 personal assistants fact-checking every sentence I write. But in an AI world, I could have that. I could actually have a lot more fact-checking and I could have another dozen of editor systems trying to propose better ways of writing. And maybe a one time management system telling me uh, wh- where I need to focus on, et cetera, et cetera. I can't afford that as a person right now because people are expensive. But if you could get cheap intelligence, you can use that. The problem is, of course, a world where you amplify human capability like that, we're also going to be misguided, stupid, and malicious people that get uh, empowered. So an empowered world is by no means a utopia. It might be a rather frighteningly dynamic place. So there is a really interesting question of how you coordinate these things, how we have people of goodwill actually effectively coordinating in a world where they're much more powerful, but the people trying to spoil the party are also more powerful. Is that coordination happening anywhere? You know, are, are you seeing or participating in conversations where people like you and Nick Bostrom and Max Tegmark and even Elon Musk are coming together and talking about how we do this? To some extent, that is, of course, happening. The usual talking heads are talking about stuff and promoting various ideas. It's been quite wild being on Twitter over the last month, especially since the letter actually demonstrated that a lot of groups that normally think of themselves as one group actually have deep splits down the middle around different views. Uh, my fellow transhumanists are very pro-technology, but some of them are so pro-technology that they expect superintendents to be very dangerous, so we need to slow things down. Other transhumanists think, no, that's horrifying, you, you, know, you can't do that. Uh, many people think that open source is brilliant, but maybe open source is something that could be tremendously dangerous, is actually de- uh, risky. So you find that a lot of groups find uneasy bedfellows. Uh, you find a lot of discourse, and I think this is fine. This is actually where the real important stuff is happening. So one interesting idea that came out from another organization I'm involved in, the AI Objectives Institute, uh, is uh, a system that we call Talk to the City. So this came out from a conversation I had with the late Peter Eckersley uh, some years ago about the economic problem of uh, figuring out what to produce, the classic information problem. And the normal answer from an economist is, yeah, the people buy stuff that sends price signals and then the entire market acts as a big machine for supplying you with the right thing. So this is why planned economies never work. And of course, socialists in the modern era might say, yeah, but maybe we can use AI to do it. So mm. Peter and me had this conversation that could you get preferences on a vast scale using AI and could that help the economy? And then we realized that actually figuring out what people want on a large scale and mapping it out is valuable on its own. So now we ended up with this system that actually can talk to people, but mostly just listen 
and catalog what are the views, what are the clusters of views. So we used that on the AI, well, not me, but the people actually doing real work in the Institute. And we found these different clusters and discourses, and it helps a little bit mapping out what are the topics, where, where are we going with this? And we can imagine building more tools for helping people navigate these complex topics. Because we are kind of used to using newspapers and statistics and uh, white papers and think tanks to figure out what might be options for policy over in Washington or London or Brussels already. But these are technologies that were invented not too long ago. Mm. Now we might add more technologies to it. And AI might be a part of actually helping us figure out better coordination methods. We're certainly nowhere close to a solution, there, but I think we can become better. We're certainly better at coordinating today than we were 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Might say, seem strange because we feel very woefully uncoordinated in this world. But that is, of course, just because we set our standards so high. We kind of demand that we should have a global solution to climate change that uh, leaves everybody more or less happy with it. That's an amazingly tall order. We are kind of demanding that there must be some consensus about how to regulate AI that we can enforce globally or at least in the big economies. Whoa, that's ambitious. A hundred years ago, people would have been very happy to just uh, get the grain taxes somewhat uh, similar between different parts of the country. If there's any system that could help us redesign our civilization or our economy so that everyone wins and that we're able to just overall increase the quality of life across the board, it could be artificial intelligence. And it's it's an interesting thought process to think about using it to ask those kinds of questions. Yeah. Um, and even if the answer is no, it doesn't work. There are these incommensurable problems that you can never resolve. Good. If we know that, we can still start working on that. We can still mm. deal with uh, those things. So I think there is a lot of cool options here. I think too many people despair about our human ability to actually reach agreements. And partially because politics in the last few years have been so bad at seeking consensus, compromise, and agreement. But that's, of course, how you actually get stuff done. Right. Um, as a friend of mine wrote in an essay about that maybe we want to slow down the AI development, that many of her friends say, oh yes, we're marching towards building these godlike super intelligence that looks like it's super hard to make them safe. And what? Slowing things down? No, that's beyond human control. And that's of course not true. We're actually slowing down most technologies, maybe even too much. My friend Robin Hanson has been complaining that this letter is just promoting uh, overregulation, and generally we should have less regulation in many domains. I think it's not necessarily true for all domains. If you're having a, some dangerous technology or a dangerous chemical, you probably want to regulate that one rather strictly. But you need to have discernment about what's dangerous and what not. And quite often we do end up with far too much regulations of hairdressers, but not enough regulations of nuclear materials. Hmm. That's interesting. I'd love to speak to Robin. Uh, I've, I've heard of uh, his work, so it'll be yeah, he's fun. with you afterwards. He's, he's an amazing gadfly. <laughs> That's awesome. Great. Excellent. Well, uh, Anders, I just wanted to finish with what are you looking forward to and excited about right now? You know, what's uh, there's a lot to be doom and gloomy about, and I think it's tough to, to keep... Uh, it's tough to keep uh, away from only being doom and gloom on this show when we're yeah. really diving into what the future could look like. So what's something that you are just super jazzed about right now and you you want to you want to tell the world about? Well, I, I'm super jazzed about the ability of using AI to both do the kind of academic grunt work, you know, to actually write out the boring parts of text or doing the literature service but also distilling things through the, into simulations and making it easier for us doing research to go and get further. So a lot of people in the AI world talk about solving matter or solving X, solving aging, for example, as if it's a, something that has a nice, neat solution. And maybe one day you can just go to your computer and ask, so what do I need to do to stop aging? And the computer will just tell you and, uh, what to do about it. But in practice, you want to build better research processes. And we're doing that. We don't know how yet. Uh, we're experimenting widely. And this is so exciting because every day 
I'm discovering something new a language model can do for me. Or I'm discovering something that it cannot do, that I might need to wait several months before it might be able to do. Or even some big, interesting flaw worth investigating. So it's really exciting uh, because we're uh, ma- meeting this entirely new environment where there's so many low-hanging fruits, and many of them are very beneficial. Last week, I discovered that uh, you could use language models to come up with, with exam questions uh, for exam. They're not great at so- right now at solving exam questions in physics. They make maths errors that are stupid and they get very confused. But they're surprisingly good at coming up with the kind of questions that you as a teacher would like to ask. You can essentially feed in a curriculum and have it come up with a lot of exam questions. And then you can select the best ones and uh, nudge them. That is saving a lot of time. And I think we can use this to generate a lot of useful small work that we tend to be too impressed by the moments of sheer genius that people or machines sometimes show. But much of the world is run by maintenance. Much of the world is run by that unconscious uh, cleaning and modifying and heavy lifting, which is not glamorous, but is needed. And I think we're getting much better at dealing with that. And And then, of course, I'm more efficient. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The world is becoming more efficient. Of course, we're constantly noticing new kinds of inefficiencies. We're getting annoyed when the reception on our cell phone is slightly off, not recognizing that we're carrying around supercomputers in our pocket that work globally. So we are going to be super annoyed at our future AI helpers because we're not quite as helpful, not quite as polite, and so on. So. I have this feeling that the future humans are going to be like Olympian gods uh, and they're going to be complaining about the nectar ambrosia because it's not quite the right color. And we, their ancestors uh, might say, yeah, what are you complaining about? Just like the, our medieval ancestors might say, whoa, you, you're not uh, running a risk of getting killed on the way to uh, job, uh, your job. Uh, you're not starving. Uh, you're not uh, suffering from deadly plagues. Uh, and, at least not as deadly as our plagues. Whoa, what are you complaining about? Right. But I think it's a fun thing to realize that we're moving into a pretty fantastic world. But the turbulence of that move is going to mean that we need to pay attention. We need to uh, be rather deft and uh, agile. And that's tricky for most of us. Yeah, human beings are so good at just not quite being satisfied. <laughs> so we, I think that's what's... In many ways, brilliant. So um, the Goethe's Faust, after all, mild spoiler alert, uh, is all about Faust being dissatisfied, uh, and uh, uh, if he ever gets satisfied, then the, de- the, the, the uh, then uh, I think he goes to heaven. But the, the basic thing that ends the, no- uh, the story is when he actually sees that whoa, the Dutch they're holding back the sea, they're actually rebuilding land, they're making stuff. This is human ingenuity. And he's finally kind of satisfied, not about himself, but about what humanity is doing. But that dissatisfaction is, of course, what is driving the Dutch people to hold back the sea of the building seawalls and the making windmills. So there is some paradox here. We want to be satisfied and that makes us do useful stuff. But once we're satisfied, yeah, that it's a good thing it doesn't last. Right. Well, I, uh, I, I can't thank you enough, Anders, for your time today and it's always a pleasure and uh, my audience loves you. So, you know, oh. I'm sure you're used to that here in that. Uh, so, uh, and, and you mentioned your Twitter account. I cannot recommend Anders's Twitter highly enough. It's my, one of my favorites on there. You're constantly retweeting and commenting on, on a whole wide range of topics. So, um, are there any other links that you would want people to go to and check out? Um, obviously uh, you're also so, provide so your bio think, page and everything. I might want to do an ad for the AI Objectives Institute. I think uh, we're starting to get interesting materials up there on thinking about artificial intelligence and markets and how they rub against each other in slightly weird ways, not just in terms of unemployment, but there's also are markets a form of artificial intelligence. Can we extrapolate uh, people's views as a good feedback into markets and policy making? Can we learn some clever things on how we regulate markets? to regulate AIs. So that's mm. one the little tip. But yeah, Interesting. generally there is just so much going on. And uh, sometimes I feel stressed out about that. And then I realize, yeah, but imagine the opposite. Imagine <laughs> not having too much going on. What a horrifying world that would be. Yeah, we, well, we definitely don't have that problem 
<laughs> Sometimes boredom sounds nice, but we definitely don't have that problem. Well, Anders, yeah. I can't thank you enough. Have a great day, and we'll probably have you on again as soon as the next big thing happens. So yeah. if that's all right with you. Oh, see you shortly. Right,